Before I get into the details of my um, research and the topic um, of today, which is, as you know, on the processing of imperfect language, I want to um, give you an intuition about how critical language is to our day-to-day -day lives and to our, our society and to human history, to this sort of um, superstructure of ideas and science and intellectual, um, our intellectual disciplines that we built up over millennia. So take an example like, um, especially uh, over the last week or so, people have been spending a lot of time talking about the Constitution. And one of the things that is interesting to appreciate is that if it weren't for language, obviously there would be no Constitution. That is, there would be no document that had been written down, and there, would be, uh, there wouldn't be this uh, collection of words that we uh, recognize as one of the most important uh, documents of, um, of democracy. So we could ask questions, too, about how language evolved, but that seems to be a very, very difficult question, a tough nut to crack, in part because so much of the evolutionary history is gone at this point. But one thing that we do know about language and what it probably evolved for is that it most likely evolved to facilitate face-to-face -face communication. And I think that this is an really important idea and, it's, and what it tells us is that dialogue and conversation are fundamental. And so listening, speaking, and turn-taking are phenomena of language that we're going to have to understand if we want to have a complete theory of how language is processed. Prosody is uh, the system of grammar that gives utterances their rhythmic and melodic properties. For example, in English, we tend to put the main stress at the ends of sentences. So if I were to say something like, Bill went to the store, notice that the emphasis is on the word store. It has, uh, it's a little louder, it's a little, and it's a little longer than, than that same word would be if it were in an earlier position uh, um, in the sentence. In addition, sentences have, spoken utterances have, a very characteristic melody to them. So in English and in many other languages, a pitch drops over the course of the utterance. And this is called declination. And there's actually interesting work suggesting that listeners, uh, that if listeners are able to judge when a sentence would have ended if it's abruptly cut off. And you might wonder, well, what's the purpose of an ability like that? And uh, one um, interesting suggestion that's been made is that it allows us to project when our interlocutor is going to be finishing up his or her turn, which means that when they do, we can jump into the conversation and make our turn as well. So prosody conveys a lot of information that's independent of the words and the syntactic structure of the sentence. So we know that prosody distinguishes um, statements from questions. Prosody distinguishes sarcasm from sincere um, utterances. And one more additional aspect of prosody that I want to highlight for today is that we know that syntactic phrases are typically marked prosodically. There's a very tight link between prosodic rep syntactic representations and prosodic representations. So the syntactic boundaries tend to be marked by things like the lengthening of a syllable at the end of a syntactic phrase, a pause, and also a pitch drop at the end of the syntactic phrase. They're not perfectly correlated, but they're correlated enough that we know prosody provides strong cues to listeners about the syntactic structure that they're trying to process. And so what this, what this um, suggests is that syntactic ambiguity, which is a topic that I've spent a lot of my career investigating, and which I, like many other researchers, have tended to investigate, investigate using written paradigms, reading paradigms, um, eye tracking during reading, for example. These paradigms, while they're very useful, they 
do give us a, uh, they don't tell us about the way that prosody can be used to avoid syntactic ambiguity or to avoid being led down a garden path due to the presence of a syntactic ambiguity in a sentence. And so one, uh, so take an example like, while Mary bathed the baby plate in, a cri in the crib, which is a sentence from uh, so, uh, some experiments that I did. So when we present that sentence to subjects, we present it in written form. We deprive them of punctuation so that we can lure them into a garden path while Mary bathed the baby played in the crib. When you get to played, you realize, oh, the baby's not the object of bathe, it's the subject of the main clause, and you have to do a syntactic reanalysis. Now, notice that in spoken language, the temptation to take the baby as the object of bathe is going to be far, far weaker, because you, the way the sentence would typically be spoken is it would be something like, while Mary bathed, the baby played in the crib. So you have all kinds of cues to the syntactic structure of the sentence. And one thing that I think this um, suggests about language processing is that, yes, we can study syntactic processing in the absence of prosody, but if we look at it from a sort of a, uh, a perspective of what, did, what kinds of problems did the language system evolve to try to solve, the, pro the processor that's deprived of prosody could be relatively handicapped. It doesn't have a source of information that's critical to um, normal comprehension. And that it, it probably evolved to depend on that source of information. Now, of course, this isn't to suggest that there's anything wrong with studying reading, and I continue to do it. I continue to study language processing through visual presentation of stimuli. I just think we need to be very careful to make clear the limitations of the paradigm and make sure that when we say that we're making claims about language processing, we're not actually making claims that really need to be restricted to reading specifically. And the other aspect of language that is, of spoken language that I think is really important and now is going to bring me to the uh, specific topic of this presentation is that speakers have much less of an opportunity to plan their utterances than, uh, than writers do. And that's partly because the process of revision in spoken language is very obvious, as, as you've no doubt noticed in the last few minutes. So when a speaker has to plan, the speaker pauses, if the speaker makes a mistake and wants to fix it, all of that is completely visible to the um, other participants in the, in the communication. And there's a lot of time pressure in conversation so we don't have the luxury of sitting back and planning our utterances to make them perfect and fluent. And as a result, we know that spoken language has a lot of crud in it, and it has um, outright errors. So one of the things that I've been very interested in in, in my research over the last uh, 15, 20 years is trying to get a theory of how the language system processes this imperfect input. So one of the things that speakers do is they say things like, well, when you get to the light, you should turn left. I mean, turn right. So we're very interested in self-repairs because they have this property where the listener typically doesn't know that a mistake has been made until the correction is in motion. So let's take the example again. Turn left, um, I mean, turn right at the light. The portion that's spoken in error, when I say turn left, at that point, you have no basis on which to suspect that I've made a speech error. And so you integrate that word into your ongoing representation of what I've said. Then when I say, uh, I mean, turn right, at that point, you realize, oh, turn left should be deleted from my representation. She made a mistake, and so what I need to do is somehow identify the domain of this error, identify the domain of the correction, erase the error from my representation of what the speaker said, and replace it with the repair.
So in our experiments, we um, gave people sentences like, my next door neighbor went to the animal shelter and came home with a brand new dog, um, I mean, right? And now at this point, our hypothesis was that rather than being a very passive recipient of the speech, you as the listener, when you realize that the speaker has made an error, you begin to anticipate not only that a repair is coming, but the actual content of the repair. You begin to guess uh, what the speaker is likely to say as the repair. And actually, guess isn't the right word because we have reasons to think that speakers and listeners have amassed a huge amount of data over the course of their lives about the kinds of things that people are likely to say. So if I am talking about somebody getting a new pet and I say dog in error, the very likely alternate there is cat, um, given what you know about the world and what you know about the way that semantic memory is organized. Dog and cat are close to each other, so it's not surprising that you would make an error and retrieve one when you meant to retrieve the other. So in our experiments, we had people listening to sentences like, my next door neighbor went to the animal shelter and came home with a uh, cute little dog, um, I mean rabbit, even though her apartment doesn't allow pets. And the idea there is that we don't give them the word that they're predicting. And we do that because we want to, we at the same time, present our subjects with the visual display. And in the visual display are cats and dogs and rabbits and some other objects as well. And we want to find evidence that when people hear dog, uh, I mean, they begin to look at the cat in anticipation of that as the repair. And they're looking at the cat even though the sentence itself never actually includes the word cat. And that's our um, evidence that people are indeed predicting the word rather than just simply integrating the word when they actually hear it. And the other set, but very, now the experiments that I'm going to tell, about you, tell you about next, um, very briefly, are experiments that we're currently working on. So we're interested in the idea that the listener is really active. So the listener is not only anticipating what the repair is likely to be, but remember I said earlier that if I, if I say turn left, uh, I mean, when you get the word left, you have no reason to think that that's an error. But that's not always true. You as a listener know that speakers make mistakes when they talk, and they make certain kinds of mistakes. And you also know that certain kinds of, of utterances are highly unlikely. So we've set up experiments in which we give people uh, sentences that are where the, there is a word that looks like it, it was probably spoken in error. So the kinds of sentences we're giving to our subjects are things like, um, uh, the, the boy put the milk back in the oven, I mean the stove, the, <laughs> put the milk back in the oven, uh, I mean the fridge. The idea there is that compared to, again, a bunch of control conditions, it's like if I say the boy put the fish back into the oven, I mean the fridge, fish can go in either place. But if I say the boy put the milk back in the oven, uh, I mean, if what, right at the point where I say oven, you as the listener might suspect, uh, no, that isn't what she intended to say. I'm going to correct the utterance right now. And we've shown in our experiments that when people get something like put the milk back in the oven, that they, and they're looking at a visual world that includes ovens and stoves and other sorts of kitchen um, situation type objects, they don't, they don't look at the oven or the stove as much as they look at the fridge, which is the item that the listener thinks the speaker intended to say. But now I'll just wrap up with a couple of conclusions. The first conclusion that I think is really significant is that we believe we've discovered that the mechanisms that are used for processing imperfect language, for processing messy and non-fluent and error-filled language, the mechanisms are the same as the mechanisms that are used to process regular language. And the uh, other major conclusion that we, uh, that we 
make from this work is simply that it is indeed possible to study spoken language in all its richness. And uh, we think that we're making some progress on the way to developing theories of language processing that are complete in the ways that um, I discussed at the beginning of the presentation.